Well, good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Last night, at least 22 innocent people were murdered by a suicide bomber in Manchester, England. Today, President Trump commented on the attack during a joint press conference with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. So many young, beautiful, innocent people living and enjoying their lives murdered by evil losers in life. I will call them from now on losers because that's what they are. They're losers. Well, you've seen this before and you know what's going to happen next. Unfortunately, our leaders are going to tell us that acts of terror are just something that happens, like the weather. Just accept it and move on. There is nothing you can do, or better yet, just pretend it's not happening all around you. As Katie Kay, the BBC, put it this morning, Europe is, quote, getting used to attacks like this because they have to, because they're never going to be able to totally wipe this out. You hear that a lot, but consider it for a minute. Why is violent terrorism an inevitability in Europe now? Unless you grew up in Northern Ireland or Italy or the Basque country, terrorism was not a significant hazard a generation or two ago. Ask someone who was alive then. This is new. Something has changed. What is it? Well, the answer, as most people understand, but relatively few admit, is that demographics change. There are a lot of Muslims living in Europe now. Most of them are indeed decent people, as we're often assured, but a surprisingly large number of them aren't. Check the numbers. In 2006, after just a year after terrorists murdered more than 50 people in London on the subway bombings, a full 20% of British Muslims said they sympathized with the motives of the bombers. Younger Muslims were even more enthusiastic about what had happened, about the killings. In 2007, Pew found that at least 20% of young Muslims here in America, in France, Germany, and Britain, and Spain, believed that suicide bombings could be justified. In France, that number was above 40%. Last year, 29% of French Muslims said they viewed Sharia as a higher law than the civil laws of France. Of course, we shouldn't be surprised that radical views are common among Western Muslims because they're even more common in their home nations. In 2014, 47% of Bangladeshi Muslims said suicide bombings to defend Islam were acceptable, almost half. A quarter of Egyptians said the same thing. A fifth of Turks and Malaysians agreed. In 2009, 78% of Pakistani Muslims told Pew that people who leave Islam should be killed, murder for apostasy. In Egypt, support for that was 86%, Afghanistan 79%, Bangladesh 44%, Iraq 42%. Well, these are not little places, obscure theocracies in remote regions. They're some of the biggest countries in the Muslim world, and more to the point, they've sent millions of immigrants to the West. We could go on like this for the whole show. There's an awful lot of research on the subject, and all the numbers tell the same story. Why are they being ignored? Now, our leaders like to boast they believe in science, that they let data and hard evidence drive their policies. They are lying, and never more obviously than in this case. They don't want to see the numbers, they actively suppress them. If you really cared about America, you wouldn't want it to become Europe, dangerous, divided, unstable. You wouldn't import a massive Muslim minority into your country simply because it made you feel open-minded and virtuous, and then hope for the best. That's a faith-based approach, and it's nuts. We know exactly what will happen if we do that, because we're watching it live on television from Manchester right now. If you really cared about the country you led, you'd figure out how to make sure that every person you imported of any religion enthusiastically shared your most cherished values, tolerance, pluralism, free speech, equality under the law, just for starters. You tell them not to litter, by the way, when they're here too. We do the opposite. Our leaders worship multiculturalism, so we encourage immigrants to reject our culture in favor of their own because all cultures are equal, except that they're not all equal as we were reminded last night with the murder of children in an arena in Manchester. Defend what you believe or you will lose it. That's the message of Manchester, just as it is also the basic lesson of all of history. But what if you don't believe in anything at all? Our leaders don't. Maybe that's why they can't defend us. Majid Nawaz is a former Islamic extremist. He's thought a lot about this. He's co-founder of the anti-Islamist group Quilliam, and he joins us tonight. Nawaz, thanks a lot for coming on. So Pleasure. what's the response from the West that wants to remain pluralist, do, certainly doesn't want to ban people based on their religion or their country? Most people don't want to do that, but they also don't want to have unstable, chaotic societies. How, what do they do? Well, currently, and you're correct, there's this uh, 
meme going around that this is the new normal, that we must just come to terms with this and that we must carry on as normal, uh, act calm, behave calm and stand united. And that's all well and good. Of course, there is a role for solidarity. It's absolutely essential. We so show solidarity to the victims and the families of this uh, horrific attack. But, you know, what kind of world is it in which I have to accept that the slaughter of my children, of youth in a concert, is normal and that's just nothing I can do about it? What exactly. kind of world do we want to live in where we just accept that as a status quo in any other world that would be called apathy and appeasement uh, in fact we should never accept that as a as a normal and, and that leads to another meme that's going around that these are somehow lone wolves which again speaks to your introduction uh, these aren't lone wolves in fact this is a myth uh, this idea of lone wolves uh, research back to facts and, and study research found that up to 80 percent of jihadist attacks uh, and the attackers are connected to networks ideologies groups and others who knew of their radicalization they are almost never alone but this myth of the fact that they are lone actors serves uh, serves three purposes mainly one is it allows security services when they commit mistakes and oversights to say there was nothing we could do about it anyway exactly. because they were lone actors exactly. we couldn't have stopped them nor predicted them uh, it allows politicians number two to say there's nothing we can do about it and that thereby retreats a political a politically correct standard uh, and third it allows most importantly our communities uh, to shirk responsibility because of course the truth is we're in the midst in Europe of a jihadist insurgency where people who are like me and, and others and live among us have become radicalized and it wasn't ISIS that radicalized them. Right. ISIS plucked the low-hanging fruit. They've been radicalized for decades because of this ideology that's been spreading in our communities. So what do we do about it? What do authorities do about it? I mean again how do you maintain a liberal, in the best sense, free society when you're actually living among people who want to kill you? I mean, how do you stop that? So if we understand it in this way, that there is an ideology that's been recruiting for decades, I say decades, and ISIS simply plucked the low-hanging fruit, then the first thing we need to do is, look, if I was living during the U.S. civil rights crisis, back in the days when segregation was still rife, you would call me an apologist if I didn't get involved to fight segregation, exactly. uh, racial segregation. You don't have to be Muslim to challenge this extremism. Muslims and non-Muslims all have to stand together to challenge Islamist theocratic extremism, just as we're responsible to challenge racism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, and other ills in, in society. So this is a full-on civil society campaign to reassert and protect our liberal values against uh, these theocratic values. And, and that, that genuinely requires action from government, uh, but more importantly, from communities. People have to stop being embarrassed and stand up for the enlightenment values that our society is based on. It doesn't seem hard, but it is hard, and you are leading the fight for that, and I appreciate your coming on tonight to talk to our audience. Thank you. Thank you.